Okay. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Julie Brigham Gretti. I'm the chair of the Global Environmental Change section at AGU. And I simply want to take this opportunity to really thank our executive committee early career members, uh, Lynn Ming, uh, Christina Barowitz, and Lauren Dennis for really inspiring uh, and organizing this event. This is the second uh, webinar of its type, and we hope to continue it by celebrating our early career uh, winners over the years. So take it away, Christina. Thanks, Julie. Everyone, um, I'm Christina Bartowitz. I'm one of the early career reps in GAC. Um, and just wanted to briefly introduce um, our section um, and our webinar today. So the AGU Global Environmental Change section focuses on large scale changes across the earth over decades of centuries. We make up a vibrant community of scholars with more than 11,000 members from 93 countries, and we are strongly committed to promoting, promoting inclusion, diversity, and equity in our section. Um, the early career representatives today are really excited for our second talk in our early career webinar series. And today um, we're featuring GEC Early Career Award winner, Dr. Ning Lin, and her lab from Princeton University. And the talk will focus on hurricane hazard and risk in a changing climate. And I'll pass it off to Lynn to introduce some of the speakers. Thanks, Christina. Uh, hello and welcome everyone. I'm Lin Meng, an early career representative at AGU Global Environmental Change section. Uh, we are very excited to have four speakers today, Dr. Ning Lin and three members from her lab. Uh, Dr. Ning Lin is an associate professor of civil and environmental engineering at Princeton University, where she has affiliate appointment with Princeton School for Public and International Affairs. Ellinger Center for Energy and the Environment, and High Meadows Environmental Institute. Dr. Lin leads the Hurricane Hazard and Risk Analysis Group at Princeton. Her group integrates science, engineering, and policy to study hurricane-related weather extremes, including strong wind, heavy rainfall, and storm surges, how they change with changing climate, and how their impact on society can be better mitigated. The group has published in high impact journals, including science, nature, climate change, and the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The group has been supported by several large NSF projects, including Career Award, inter in interdisciplinary research in hazard and disaster, prediction of and resilience against extreme events, and coastal and people hubs for research and the broadening participation. Next, we have Dr. Jia Zhixi. Dr. Xi is currently a postdoctoral research associate in Lin's group. He was formerly a graduate research assistant in Lin's group. Dr. Xi focuses on hurricane analysis and rainfall modeling. Now I'm going to pass it to Lauren to introduce the other two speakers. Hi, my name is Lauren Dennis. I'm another one of the early career representatives for GEC. And it's my pleasure to introduce our last two speakers. Avantika Gori is a fourth year graduate student in uh, Lynn's group. Ms. Gori focuses on joint and compound hazards from hurricanes. And last but not least, we have Kairo Fun, who is a fifth year graduate student in Lynn's group. Mr. Feng focuses on infrastructure resilience under hurricanes. And so before we get started, I pass it off to our speakers. I just wanted to cover a couple um, small housekeeping notes. So first, we're going to save all of our questions for the end. And so there are two ways that you could ask questions. First, by raising your hand in the webinar, and second, by entering the question into chat. And so if you have a question, but you don't want to forget during the webinar, feel free to enter it during chat, and we'll moderate those at the end. And we ask that everyone stay muted for the duration of the webinar. I'll enable focus mode so that only the speaker's videos will appear. Um, and then once the question and answer session um, appears, we will re-enable video for everyone. And also I'll add, this is our second, uh, second session of our early career webinar series. And we are featuring uh, different early career winners. But if you would like to be featured and have interest in presenting in the series, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and we would love to include more folks in our webinar series. 
And without further ado, I will pass the floor to our presenters. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks all for uh, joining the webinar. And um, um, as introduced, um, my name is Ning Ling. I'm an associate professor in uh, civil engineering, civil and mountain engineering at Princeton University. Um, so I'm glad today we get this opportunity uh, to share with you about our research. Um, so I will give an a overview uh, of the framework and the background and one component of the, the, the framework. And then uh, three group members will uh, talk about uh, three components of the framework. So we're focusing on tropical cyclone hazards and risk analysis. So for terminology, what are the tropical cyclones? This is a um, uh, map showing the historical tropical cyclone tracks over 20 years. Um, the color on each track shows the intensity of such a storm. And when this storm, these tropical storms uh, have intensity that's greater than some threshold, um, they would be called um, they would be called um, hurricanes in our region um, in North Atlantic, but also called typhoon in uh, West Pacific, can be called severe cy tropical cyclone or severe cyclone storms in other regions but they are physically uh, the same. Um, so we generally call them tropical cyclones, the TCs, or sometimes we just call them hurricanes, but we mean tropical cyclones or TCs. Um, so zooming, uh, the tropical cyclone or hurricane has a very coherent structure of, uh, with a low pressure center called I, and the, the uh, very nice uh, structure looking from the satellite. And if we look, Look at the cross section of a storm in the northern hemisphere. The surface wind will go uh, will circulate uh, counterclockwisely, going towards the storm center, and then move up along the eye wall and also the rain bands. So this eye walls and rain bands would be where we got the strongest winds and the, the uh, heaviest rainfall. And uh, in the center of the storm, the eye actually the wind will be very small or near zero. So although it's a very complex system, um, the basic structure of the hurricane can be uh, described by a simple wind profile like this. This is a wind speed as a function of distance from the center. If we think about the storm is approximately uh, uh, symmetrical and you just cut, um, cut a cross section, then the wind speed will change uh, from about zero in the center to some level of maximum wind uh, at so-called radius of maximum wind, and then decrease rapidly as a function of distance from the center to um, uh, some distance to be zero. So this distance is called out radius. So if we know these parameters, including the intensity, which is this maximum wind or central pressure deficit, the difference between the pressure at the center and the outside the environment. Um, and also the size, including this inner size or radius maximum wind and this outer size where the wind vanishes. And then we would be able to use such a simple analytical profile to describe the basic wind field. But of course, the specific shape of this profile um, would varies from model to model. Um, so Dutch will talk about a particular wind profile that we uh, developed and be using. Um, these hurricanes, when they make landfall, they can produce uh, various hazards. So they can produce extreme winds and uh, the Simpson, Simpson, uh, Safer Simpson hurricane scale. Um, what we hear from the news about category one to category five is based on the wind speed levels, um, but also um, hurricanes, they can produce extreme rainfall. This map shows the rainfall predicted for Hurricane Harvey in 2017 in Houston area. Um, they can also produce extreme storm surge and waves and causing flooding in the coastal areas. Here, this cartoon shows that, um, you know, we have a mean sea level and then we can have a storm called tide on top of the mean sea level. And then if the hurricane comes to the shore and then we can have storm surge and really from the hurricane's wind and low pressure. And the sum of the storm surge and the tide above the mean sea level is called a storm tide. And then on top of that, we can also have wind wave causing damage to coastal structures. So as 
climate changes, we can have the storms be stronger, so we can have higher storm surge. At the same time, sea level is increasing, so the total water level will be increasing. Um, people say that um, hazards will not become disasters unless they meet the vulnerability. So we have seen a uh, huge uh, damage in recent uh, hurricanes in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, indicating that our society is uh, quite vulnerable. We can also look at economic losses. Um, uh, here, Hurricane Katrina cost 135 billion, you know, Hurricane Sandy, 68 billion and so on. Um, and this figure shows actually the most devastating hurricanes in terms of economic losses worldwide from 1980 to 2019. So all of them actually from uh, happened in the United States. And um, if we look at this time history of uh, hurricane losses over time, although it's not updated for the last few years, you know, we see a trend and with very large uh, losses in the recent decades. So people have been discussing if this trend is due to climate change or due to economic development. So the conclusion is it's largely due to economic development and coastal development. In fact, if we look at the population growth uh, here in the Atlantic Gulf of Mexico coastline, um, it's been just growing so fast, uh, regardless of the occurrence of these large storms. And so if we account for this, uh, normalize this economic damage, uh, by accounting for the generation growth, economic growth along the coastline. And this trend is largely gone. So the basic conclusion is that uh, the past change has been largely driven by coastal development. So our decisions and our plannings and our building codes and policies are, are extremely important uh, looking to the future. Um, although um, the economic losses trend has not been showing the effect of climate change, um, so some analysis have shown that storms have been changing in the past decades. So this study shows that the proportion of major hurricanes or the number of major hurricanes over the, over, uh, the proportion of major hurricanes has been increasing over the past few decades. And this study shows that the storms entering coastal regions, which can cause damage, have been increasing over the past decades. And this study shows that the decay, storm will decay over land and the decay time scale, this tau, um, has been decreased, increasing, which means storms take longer time to decay over land, can cause more damage. Um, so that has been increasing over the past decades. Looking to the future, we can use various um, global climate models and coupled with downscaling method to project how hurricanes will change in the future. And uh, this study looked at uh, you know, all these different projections to look at, at how it will change. And this is showing the histogram of models showing the percentage change of intensity. So all the models agree that hurricane intensity will increase in the future. However, these models do not agree about how frequency of hurricanes will change in the future. So most models said the frequency may decrease or not changing, but a few models actually including very high resolution models have shown that climate, uh, frequency of tropical cyclones will increase in the future. So this is a big uncertainty in the uh, current study of hurricanes uh, change in under climate change. So in our risk analysis and the decision making, we should consider this big uh, uncertain parameter as an uncertain uh, parameter rather than a, uh, an, a deterministic factor. So given all this uh, background, uh, our research questions, are how can we quantify TC risk in a changing climate? Um, and uh, how can we better mitigate this risk and adapt to climate change? To answer these questions, uh, we, uh, we um, work on different um, areas that within a framework we call physics-based TC hazards and risk analysis framework. Well, in order to study the impact of climate change, we start from the uh, global reanalysis and global climate change models. But these models have resolutions relatively low um, in order to resolve tropical cyclones. So we will need a method to downscale global climate models. And in addition to uh, general regional downscaling, we need to generate a large number of storms to, uh, for risk analysis so we can look at the extremes. So we develop a TC climatology model that we can generate large number of synthetic storms characterized by 
Genesis track intensity and size under the given climate conditions. And given these parameters, we can apply various hazard models to simulate the wind, storm surge, and rainfall. And uh, a particular interest of our current research is the joint hazards uh, of, from TCs and also the compound flooding from surge and rainfall that AV uh, will talk about. Um, in addition to hazards from TCs, we're also interested in other compounding hazards, including extratropical cyclones, sea level rise, and also heat waves. Uh, imagine if we have hurricanes causing damage to our power system, and at that time, heat wave ha happens and we don't have air conditioning. That would be a compounding uh, hazard. So um, given the hazards on one hand, we also study the exposure vulnerability of our built and natural environment and combine the hazards and vulnerability information, we can quantify the risk typically characterized by probability of failure, present value of future losses, population affected, and so on, which can be used to support various risk mitigation strategies to, um, to, uh, for uh, climate change adaptation. So today, um, uh, we will talk about uh, a TC climatology model, and then uh, Da Zhi will talk about wind model and uh, rainfall model. And then Avery will talk about storm surge modeling and the compound joint and compound hazards from TCs. And then Kyrie will talk about um, compound hazards from TC blackout and heat waves um, at the end. So uh, we see that because we want to uh, study how hurricanes will change on the climate change, uh, we we cannot rely on the historical data to estimate hurricane uh, probabilities. But this problem actually stands even before we talk about the effect of climate change because historical data for tropical cyclones is very limited. So in order to understand the uh, risk um, for design and planning purposes, uh, we have been, or the communities have been using Monte Carlo simulations to generate synthetic storms with various characteristics, including this track intensity and size. And the current approaches include uh, a few uh, different ways. So the first one we call site-specific method or statistical method is that you look at the location of interest. In this case, it's Shanghai in China. This was application to uh, determine the design wing to design the tallest building in China at that time, um, um, 10 years ago, probably. And so they draw a circle of 500 kilometer radius and look at all the historical storms moving into this region and then develop probability distribution, the joint probability distributions of these parameters of this based on this data. And then do Monte Carlo simulations based on that distribution to generate a lot more synthetic storms representing the uh, hurricane climate in this region. So this method has been used to um, determine the design wind for you know, our tallest buildings and longest, longest bridges around the world. But this method has a limitation that if you don't even have enough storms in this location to start with, you won't be able to generate these distributions to draw from. So to overcome that limitation, another method called basin-wide statistical uh, track model um, so instead of looking at the location of interest, uh, the method is to perform statistical simulation of storms over the whole basin uh, from the storm genesis track to, the, uh, to landfall. And then if you generate a lot of storms over the whole basin, you will have enough storms at a particular location, uh, even if that location doesn't have much historical record. Um, so this method has been used uh, to develop the ESC uh, wind maps for design guidance. And by the way, the first method is also uh, developed further into so-called joint probability method and has been used to de develop the uh, flood maps um, that we use in the insurance, uh, federal insurance program. So both of these methods currently do not account for the effect of climate change. So our flood maps and our building codes are not accounting for the effect of climate change. So the third method called deterministic statistical method developed by many others that we used a lot. And the most of the results we're presenting today will be based on this model. So this model would generate the tracks um, based on statistically based on the uh, statistics of the climate environment and then generate intensity 
um, based on the deterministic uh, atmospheric ocean coupled model. So the core of the method is this deterministic model. So here we have a picture showing the distribution of enthalpy uh, um, uh, in this uh, cross section of a storm. Um, so this method has been widely used and we used it a lot that we'll talk about, but it's, it's, um, um, it's, very, it's, it's, it's fundamentally physically based and they, it could be very difficult uh, to apply for engineers and people who are not um, in the um, uh, um, um, atmospheric science community. Um, so to, uh, in our group, in addition to applying this method, we also develop a model that's kind of in between these two models is to develop a statistical model, a statistical basin model, but based on the physical parameters that uh, was used in this uh, physical model. So this model we developed with, uh, called Princeton Environment Dependent Probabilistic Tropical Cyclone Models uh, or PAPCs. It was developed by, by my former, former uh, graduate student, uh, Ren Zhijing. So basically we establish statistical relationship between the TC environment to be identified or identified based on the physical uh, models and studies uh, between this TC environment and uh, the storm features, including genesis track uh, in uh, wind intensity and out radius. Um, and the, based on uh, out radius and the wind intensity, we can estimate uh, the radius maximum wind, and then we can estimate the central pressure. And so all these parameters will be uh, uh, connected. So specifically for the genesis part, we modeled the genesis as a dependent, um, dependent uh, spatial temporal Poisson process. So on each uh, of our ocean for each grid and in each month, we model it as a Poisson distribution with Poisson parameter dependent on the environmental variables that relevant for the genesis, including uh, vorticity, relative humidity, potential intensity, and wind shear. Um, and the interesting uh, feature of this model is rather than performing the regression on the regular grid, we perform the regression on clustering grids based on similarity of environmental variables. For example, the Atlantic Basin in this month uh, can be divided into 17 cluster grids. Uh, so each, uh, each represent a, a, a environmental state, a environmental, or each, um, each clustering grid uh, groups or the small grids uh, that have similar climate environment. So this will overcome the limitation of previous models performing regression on the regular grid because um, uh, the statistical challenges, if you have many grids that are, have zero um, hurricane sits. And then we can perform simulations also on this kind of uh, clustering grids. And the counts will be uniformly distributed within the grid scale and months. Uh, the simulations compare well with observations in uh, various uh, aspects. This figure shows a comparison of the annual rate for the whole basin uh, from the observation in uh, red and the simulation in black um, with uncertainty. So we can largely capture the the variation of the counts from year to year. And this figure shows a comparison of the distribution of the uh, hurricanes over the, uh, uh, over the year um, to capture the seasonal variability. And here we're showing the comparison of simulated and observed spatial distribution of genesis. So we can largely capture the spatial pattern, although we're kind of underestimating uh, for this region, or so-called main development region. Um, given the SIDS, or given the, the, the genesis, we can uh, simulate the track. We developed analog wind TC track model. Um, so this model uh, moves the track or the storms depending on the environmental wind, as well as the historical pattern of the storms um, um, at, um, uh, given the previous, uh, previous uh, direction. So the model uh, is trained with a random forest algorithm um, and achieving very good um, R square. So here we're comparing uh, samples of simulated tracks versus samples of observed tracks. You can see that we can capture the pattern, including this recurring feature of the tracks into the Atlantic. And the, this figures, uh, this is comparing the track density 
or the you know, density in each grid uh, of the track from uh, observation, so-called IV track and uh, simulation here. So we can capture the pattern quite well. Um, along each track, we model the intensity of the storm, which could be uh, quite complex. Um, and so this intensity change depends on various environmental variables, including potential intensity, wind shear, relative humidity, and ocean parameter. Um, and also the current intensity of the storm and last step intensity change. So the simple way and previous models have been applied to just generate a linear regression between these predictors and the intensity change. Um, but we found that this intensity change um, is, uh, is not homogeneous. This figure shows a six hour intensity change, um, largely referring to three groups, uh, static, meaning they don't change much, um, or the normal, or the extremes, the red ones, including rapid intensifications and rat rapid intensifications. Those are the most difficult ones to predict uh, in weather prediction. So we model uh, so so that we 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 figured to model um, the storm intensity change um, for these three states and as a Markov chain moving among these three states. Um, so the Markov chain would have an initial intent, initial um, probability will have the state transition probability matrix, and then have for each state we have a probability of in intensity change uh, given the state. And all these probabilities are depending on this uh, X or the predictors, including all these variables. For example, when X are at the medium values, uh, this diagram shows the probability of the storm intensity change maybe moving from one state to the other. And uh, this figure shows the, uh, the probability distribution of intensity change for each state. As you can see, that state one is centered about zero, but state three have, can have very large intensity change. Um, so that's the extreme state. So for evaluation, here we're showing the observed intensity on the uh, tracks in Atlantic versus simulated intensity on the observed track for Atlantic. So we can largely capture the, 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 the pattern of distribution. And we're most interested in landfall intensity. Here we're dividing the coastline into three sections. And we look at the landfall intensity as a function of return period for all the coastlines and also these three sections. So the black shows the observation, 36 year observation, the red shows 36 year simulations, and the blue shows 3,600 years of simulations. As you can see that our simulations compare very well with observations, but our simulations can generate a lot more storms to estimate extremes that we haven't seen in the historical record. So that's our uh, TC climatology model that we actually just uh, developed, but in parallel, we have been applying this uh, Emmanuel uh, deterministic uh, statistical deterministic TC, TC method to generate synthetic storms for risk analysis over the years that we're going to present. So um, for example, here was our first study was for New York City um, that we generated 5,000 storms under the current climate. Um, and then another 5,000 storms under the future, for the future climate under one particular climate model. And then we do that for four climate models. So we generate many, many of these net storms on the different climate state, and then perform wind storms of rainfall analysis to estimate the hazards and see how the hazards will change from current to future. So the, the results we're going to present next will be based on uh, this model. So, um, with that, I will uh, give it to Da Zhi uh, to continue. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm going to show the slides from my end, or, or you're going you to. You can just show? continue. Oh, actually, um, you need to control it. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but. I, why, why don't I, you I, show it from your end? Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh... Uh, can you can 
can you all see yeah. the slide? Yeah. So are you, are you seeing the presenter view or still the? Yeah. Yeah. It's good. So it's, it's fine, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. C and I'm a, a postdoc in Professor Lin's group. Uh, in this time, I'm going to introduce you the modeling of travel cyclone wind and rainfall for the head assessment. And during my PhD study, I focused on uh, TC rainfall modeling and has assessment. So in this talk, I will spend more time on the rainfall, but I will first introduce uh, travel cyclone wind uh, simulations as is not only important by itself, but because wind is the primary hazard caused by the TC, it's also important because a simulated wind drives the TC rainfall simulation. Uh, I think people probably are quite familiar with some uh, empirical travel cycle wind profile models such as the well-known Holland model. However, in our group, we are instead using a more physically based or physically derived wind profile models. Uh, for the TC in the core region, uh, in the core region based on the uh, angular momentum balance theory and, uh, and the theory of the outflow uh, stratification, Emmanuel and uh, Rutuno uh, in, 20, uh, in 2011, de uh, derives an equation for the angular momentum uh, in the, uh, for the convective inner core. And in 20, uh, 2004, uh, based, on the, uh, based on the assumption that the outer region is free of convection, Emmanuel also derived an equation for the angular momentum at the TC outer region. Solving these two equations, will give us the profile of the angle momentum and, and we can transfer it into the uh, wind speed. Uh, however, it will give us two wind profiles that are valid for the inner core and outer, uh, outer radius respectively. And, uh, uh, and Shavas and Lin at uh, 2015 uh, math developed the mathematical method to merge the two profiles, the two um, Emmanuel uh, ER11 and E04 profiles and come up with a complete wind profile model. Uh, the model uh, this model, as we will show later, is used for TC rainfall uh, has assessment uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, during this uh, uh, for quite a different aspect of my research in the trouble cycle rainfall simulation uh, work. Uh, what we just talked about is, the, is about the wind profile model. For various engineering applications, uh, it is needed to also obtain a 3D uh, wind field in the travel cycle boundary layer, which is the layer most close to uh, the ground. Uh, to solve this uh, wind field, uh, currently a, a working method would be solving the steady state uh, momentum equations and the, and the continuity equations. The momentum equations, two momentum, uh, three momentum equations and the continuity equation uh, that they, it can describe the TC boundary layer by impose the gradient uh, wind profile as the boundary condition, uh, also with other boundary conditions uh, representing the surface uh, status. Uh, one can solve this set of equation uh, using various kinds of numerical method. Uh, by solving these equations, you can obtain the, uh, the 3D wind profile. For example, the left figure showing the cross section uh, of, the, of the wind where we can see that it can solve the uh, inflow from the outer radii, the strong convection, and the very strong wind jet uh, uh, in the travel cycle boundary layer. And you can also see that we can solve a, a, a cyclonic wind field that which is consistent with the observation of the travel cycle. Uh, with enough set of the, of the travel cycle uh, 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 wind modeling, uh, we will move to a relatively uh, new topic of travel cycle rainfall simulation. Uh, in the 2020, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the 2000, that decade, uh, people were using very simple uh, statistical model to simulate uh, TC rainfall. A well-known benchmark model is the R clipper, the ring clipper. It is simply uh, simulate the uh, radio profile of the travel cycle rainfall. Uh, the model is uh, fitted by the satellite and uh, gauge observation where you can see that the model basically have the rainfall varying across uh, different radii of the travel cycle. And these parameters can be estimated from TC intensity. Uh, you can see that here we show the comparison of uh, Hurricane Fran uh, 
where the left figure is the gauge observation and the right figure is the uh, archaic model simulation, we can see that uh, this model does not capture the structure of the trouble cycle rainfall very well. So there are some improvement made on that model. Later, uh, Longfed improves the uh, this archaeological model by adding some complexity into the this simple model. First, the asymmetry, the asymmetry of the rainfall caused by the wind shear is added, and um, which which is by performing a, a Florian analysis of the asymmetrical wind uh, rainfall field uh, related to the trouble cycle. And it also and secondly, it also added the topography forcing uh, that. Uh, where the, top, where the topography lifting can cause strong convections and lead to rainfall. However, uh, even though these, um, these uh, empirical or statistical model have uh, some limitations, for example, it does not, it, uh, first and foremost, it's not based on physical mechanisms. So it is hard to say whether that kind of model will still work in, under the climate change. And second, it ignores uh, it ignores the surface roughness differences, which are quite important uh, uh, to simulate the rainfall when trouble cycle is making landfall. For example, if you take a look at the left figure, you would see that in observation, we have very strong rainfall uh, when the trouble cycle is making landfall, where that is not captured uh, very well using this simple uh, archaeological model. And third, it does not take humidity into consideration, which is definitely a very important factor. Uh, uh, in trouble cycle rainfall modeling. Uh, a better way to model TC rainfall would be, uh, would be model it based on the physical mechanisms that generates the rainfall. The mechanisms for TC rainfall is very complex, but it's largely uh, follows the water balance equation where the uh, rain rate equals to the multiplication of precipitation efficiency, which is epsilon and the vertical water vapor transport, which is Q times W. The main part of a physics-based trouble cycle range model, or we call it TCR, is to estimate the vertical velocity. This model covers uh, mainly four mechanisms to generate the vertical velocities, which are frictional convection, um, uh, frictional convection, topography forcing, the vortex stretching, and the baroclinic effect or wind shear effect. Uh, we evaluate the model with both satellite and radar observation. Here we show that example of the comparison, uh, the, the comparison of the model and the observation of the landfall in TC uh, total rainfall from 20, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2002 to 2012 in the Gulf Coast. Uh, we see that the TCR generally compares quite, very well, no matter comparing to the radar observation or the satellite observation. However, just from the model formulation, we can see that the model does have some limitations. First, as the model is focused on modeling the convections, it does not consider stratiform uh, rainfall, which occurs a lot in green bands. Also, the similar rainfall is dominated by the friction term, which in this model is, developed, is derived from the slab boundary layer model. And the slab boundary layer model is too simple that are proven to be not as accurate as a high resolving, uh, high resolving model, such as the one I introduced before. And finally, very importantly, the Barraclinic term, which was intended to model the rainfall related to wind shear, is not suitable for those storms that um, are going through uh, actual tropical transitions. Uh, these storms are under very strong shear environment and can produce uh, great rainfall. As an example, we can, uh, if you remember Hurricane Irene, 2011, it produced a lot of rainfall in, uh, uh, in the East Coast, which are related to the actual tropical transition. So future research could actually improve this model based on this uh, to address these limitations. Here we show the comparison of the TC annual average rainfall in the US Northeast. We see that TCR underestimates the rainfall compared with satellite observation. It may relate to the storms going through actual tropical transition, as I mentioned before, where the TCR has very limited uh, representation in that aspect. Another bias of TCR we find is related to the TC rainfall time series. We compare the TC rainfall time series in the stage four uh, radar observation and uh, uh, TCR simulation. We find that TCR simulated uh, time series have larger 
and delayed peaks. Though this may not influence the simulated TC total rainfall, it could potentially influence the application of this model in flood modeling, especially when we are talking about compound flood modeling, where the time of the peak can be very important. I think Avi probably will talk more on that. Uh, I have introduced the rainfall model. Then I will move to the trouble cycle rainfall has assessment. Uh, in a pilot study, uh, Emmanuel coupled the TCR with a synthetic soil model. He used the coupled models to estimate the return period of Houston TC rainfall in both current and future climate to, to look at whether, for example, the storm like Harvey will happen more frequent or not. Uh, for, for example, in, in Houston, under current climate conditions, the average time between two arrivals of storms with three milli 300 millimeters of rainfall is around 100 year, or we call it 100 year event. Well, in the future interval can be around like 20 year. Uh, to assess uh, the rainfall hazard, especially to get a return period such as 100 year return period, we cannot only use observations because we don't have that many of the observational data. Uh, in fact, we use synthetic stool models, which Professor Ling has uh, uh, talked a lot. Uh, in this study, Emmanuel used the physics-based TC model, which are shown in the upper figure. We will also couple TCR with other synthetic stool models, such as the model developed in our group, the, the, uh, the PEPC model, uh, shown in the below to assess TC rainfall hazard. However, as we can imagine, just uh, uh, just from our uh, knowledge, uh, there could be differences between synthetic stool models. Uh, we need to know how well the differences between the synthetic stool models influence our estimation of TC rainfall hazard. To do so, we need to first identify what parameters may strongly influence the estimated TC rainfall hazard. Uh, in a recent study, we identified these important parameters by applying a lasso regression between TCR simulated TC event total rainfall and a pool of parameters between um, uh, and the pool of parameters that uh, may have influence on the TC rainfall hazard. After applying a lasso regression, we determine that the maximum intensity of the storm, the minimal distance between the storm to the point that we are studying, and the duration when the storm is around the point of interest are three most important parameters. Uh, these important parameters can be used to understand the uncertainty of TC rainfall hazard assessment. Uh, let's look at the example. We couple uh, two synthetic uh, storm models with TCR to downscale the TC rainfall hazard in the current climate. Uh, one is the Emmanuel's model, and the other one is PEPC, it's the model developed in our group. We find that in the East Coast, PEPC shows higher 10 year return level of TC rainfall hazard than the Emmanuel model. To understand why that happened, we compare the mean of the three parameters the intensity, distance, and duration simulated by the two models. We find that there are no significant differences between maximum intensity and the minimal distance simulated by the two synthetic storm models, but the duration in the East Coast is significantly longer in the PEPC model than in the Emmanuel model. And that explains why rainfall hazards simulated by two synthetic storm models are different in the East Coast. Uh, identifying these important parameters can, al can also lead us to understand uh, what parameters or what physical mechanisms um, controls the uh, change of the trouble cycle rainfall has on the climate change. However, due to time limit and uh, that work is still uh, ongoing, uh, I will just uh, say that and uh, leave the presentation to our next presenter. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Daji. I will share my screen now. Okay, so um, I'll pick up our talk and um, continue, and I will be discussing uh, tropical cyclone joint hazards and compound flooding. So, um, so far we've talked about TC climatology, wind, rainfall, um, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about storm surge, which is another very important hazard that Professor Lin mentioned, and also the joint occurrence of tropical cyclone rainfall and storm surges in coastal regions um, and how that can impact flooding uh, in coastal catchments. So just to motivate, um, I have two figures here. Basically, 
Um, coastlines across the world are vulnerable to the occurrence of joint high sea level from storm surge and high rainfall. Um, and so in particular, um, the area that's circled here, which is the US Atlantic and Gulf Coast, there's a high correlation between rainfall and storm surges. And this correlation is primarily driven by um, extratropical and tropical cyclones. And in particular, the most extreme types of joint flood events are driven by tropical cyclones um, in this region. We also, if we look at the bottom figure, the dependence between storm surge and rainfall might be rising in some locations along the U.S. coastline. So here uh, showing for New York and St. Petersburg, Florida, throughout the 20th century, the correlation between rainfall and storm surge has been increasing through time, suggesting that the threat of these joint flood events might be rising. So when rainfall and storm surges co-occur, um, the rainfall runoff and the inland propagating storm surge can interact in such a way that the overall flooding, the extent and depth of overall flooding is increased. And this is called a compound flood. So first I wanted to understand um, what, is the, what was the current and project the future probability of having extreme rainfall and extreme storm surge occur at the same time. Um, so to answer this question, um, we utilize the coupled physics-based method. So we've talked a lot about this already. So um, if you remember, we utilize this framework where we can take reanalysis or GCM output. We can use Emmanuel's track model to generate thousands of synthetic tracks consistent with a specific climate state. And then we can use the TC rainfall model that Daji talked about to generate rainfall fields. We then model the storm tides within a basin scale hydrodynamic model called ADCIRC, which I'll talk about in a little bit, to generate storm surges at the coast from each of the synthetic tracks. And then finally, we utilize a multivariate um, joint hazard analysis to get quantify the probability of having extreme storm surge and extreme rainfall co-occurring. And we can also add in the impact of future sea level rise by accounting for probabilistic rates of sea level rise. So here we use the probabilistic distribution from COP et al. Um, and in our most recent study, we conducted this methodology for the historical period from 1980 to 2005. And then using the high emission 8.5 scenario, we projected the future joint probability from 2070 to 2100. Uh, so just a little bit on the storm tide model. So we utilize an unstructured computational mesh. Um, this is showing an image of the mesh and you can see that in the deep ocean, we have very coarse triangular elements, but we can get very high resolution at the coastline by leveraging this unstructured mesh so that we can generate high resolution storm surge estimates along the entire US Gulf and Atlantic coast. Um, so we use this model to generate storm tides at the coast for each of the synthetic tracks. So we wanted to understand what was the probability or the return period of having 100 year rainfall and 100 year storm surge at the same time. So what is the return period in the historical climate and then project how that will change in the future under future sea level rise and future storm climatology. And the main takeaway is that the combination of the storm climatology change and sea level rise will drastically increase the frequency of joint extreme events. So the top image is showing the joint return period of 100 year rainfall and 100 year storm surge um, from 1980 to 2005. And in general, we see along the Gulf of Mexico, this joint return period ranges from around 200 to 400 years. Um, along the Mid-Atlantic, this ranges from 300 to 600 years. And then along the coastline of New England, which is shown here in green, um, this is a very rare event. So the return period is over a thousand years. But in the future climate, 
um, there will be a drastic reduction in the return period, which means these events will become much more frequent. Um, so the bottom image shows uh, the return period by the end of the 21st century. And we can see that in the Gulf of Mexico, this now becomes a 10 to a 30 year event between a five to a 15 year event in the mid-Atlantic and about a five year event along the coastline of New England. So um, the combination of sea level rise and storm climatology change, assuming a high emission scenario would result in a very large increase in the joint hazard or the joint probability of extreme rainfall and extreme storm surges. The next question we want to answer is how we can use these large scale projections. So now we've had projections for the entire US Atlantic and Gulf Coast. How can we use those projections to delineate flood hazard at the local scale? So at the catchment scale. Um, so here we have another kind of coupled physics based modeling methodology. So steps one, two, and three, we already discussed. We generate the tracks, we generate the rainfall fields, and we generate the storm tides and incorporate sea level rise. Now, with this methodology, we have thousands and thousands of synthetic tracks, but it's very computationally expensive to do the flood modeling for each of these tracks um, because flood models have to be very high resolution. Um, and they require a lot of computational resources to run a single flooding scenario. So to help us out, we implement the joint probability optimal sampling method. Um, so I won't go into details here, but um, if you have questions, you can always email me. This method is a multivariable um, optimization method that allows us to select a small number of storms um, and use a smaller set of storms model the flooding in order to capture the full distribution of the flood hazard. So from thousands of synthetic tracks, we end up choosing just between 100 or 150 tracks that we do the high resolution modeling. So then we have an inundation model that we can take sea level rise, storm tides, rainfall fields, and river flows. And we can do the joint modeling um, within this high resolution inundation model to generate compound flood maps that are very high resolution at a particular catchment. Um, in our case, we applied this modeling methodology to the Cape Fear River in North Carolina. So this image is showing just the entire Cape Fear Basin, but we focus on the black portion, which is the coastal component. And then here I'm showing some more details of our inundation model. So we use a 2D shallow water equation uh, model uh, called HECRAS with 60 meter grid cell resolution. And we also have a one meter subgrid inundation modeling um, scheme as well. So we generate very high resolution flood inundation estimates. Uh, of course, so we validate this model using high water marks from different historical tropical cyclones. So here you can see the observed depth and the model depth correlate well. We also compare our modeled water level time series with the observations from NOAA tidal gauges. Um, and you can see that we do a good job of recreating the water level time series. Um, so next we delineate which areas of the catchment are dominated by different hazards. So areas of red are areas that are rainfall driven. So here the flooding is primarily a function of the rainfall runoff. Areas of blue are storm surge driven. So here the flooding is primarily driven by storm surges. But you can also look at, for example, if we zoom into this tributary called Town Creek, some areas of yellow and green, and these are areas that are called transition zones. So here, both the rainfall runoff and the storm surge are driving the total water level. So neither hazard alone um, could predict the overall flooding, but actually their interaction causes exacerbated flood levels. So this kind of shows why it's important that we jointly model the flooding from rainfall and storm surge within a single flood model. So finally, we can answer the question, how does climate change impact 
the 100 year water levels in the Cape Fear River. Um, so in the first image, we're just looking at the historical 100 year water levels. In the second, we're looking at the 100 year water levels from the historical climatology plus 2100 sea level rise. And we see in the main stem of the river, a large increase in the depth um, that's associated with the sea level rise uh, by the end of the 21st century. If we then incorporate also changes in TC climatology, so that's figure C, we can see even higher pluvial flooding. So that would be kind of all of the flooding in the overland areas, uh, flooding in tributaries, and then even worse flooding along the river and coastline. Um, so using this kind of coupled physics-based methodology, we can get really high resolution projections of how flooding will change at the catchment scale due to the combination of future TC climatology and sea level rise. Um, so I will leave it there and let our last speaker, Kyrie, take the mic. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, thank you. Oh, OK, so hi, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the tropical cyclone power outage and blackout heat with compound hazard. Uh, in, United State, uh, in United States history, nine of 10 biggest blackouts are led by TC or hurricane. So hurricane can have very large wind and surge uh, that can lead to large power outage. So as the most extreme case, Hurricane Maria caused uh, or 1,248 million customer hours of blackouts. Uh, different from blackouts due to operational uh, faults, blackouts after hurricane is more localized, but has a longer duration. So for example, the average power restoration time after Northeast blackout is 12 hours. However, after hurricanes, it usually takes local utility several weeks to restore the power. Uh, the map on the right panel showed the power outage and restoration process of Hurricane Irma. Uh, so we can find that the blackout developed when hurricane approaching uh, at peak level, 70% uh, Florida customers lost power. The restoration, uh, the restoration take one week. Uh, th this means local business need to wait for power restoration to continue, which largely impact the daily life of local customers. Uh, in the last 20 years, we could also find that the total power disruption is increasing, and 70% of that is contributed by weather-related events. Uh, under climate change, we could imagine hurricanes would have much more impact uh, on United States power system. Uh, under climate change, temperature is rising almost for sure, and hurricanes usually happen in summer. This leads us to imagine that under post-hurricane blackout, when uh, air condition is down, uh, how could we survive the extreme temperature? Uh, so we call this kind of event TC blackout heat wave compound hazard. Uh, this TC blackout heat wave compound hazard has happened recently. Uh, we have one of most active hurricane season in 2020, uh, where storms caused uh, ser serious power failures uh, along the US Gulf Coast. Uh, in particular, people left uh, in Southwest Louisiana suffered great uh, from category four Hurricane Laura, especially when it was followed by a heat wave. Uh, an SWSU heat adversary and advised people to stay in air conditioning environments. However, air condition is not available to most of them. Uh, so in 2021, Hurricane Ida again is a category four hurricane land landfalling in Louisiana. Huge power failure happened after Ida, uh, which lasts four weeks. Uh, and left more than a million without power in deadly heat with heat index of 105 to 107 degrees. Uh, at least 10 deaths in New Orleans was tied to the heat. 
Uh, now we are developing a new framework to assess hurricane blackout heat wave resilience. We simulate TC climatology and hazards uh, and heat wave climatology from general uh, circulation models, uh, which is GCMs. So, and we explicitly model the power system failure and recovery process under the uh, climate uh, under the hazard scenarios. Uh, the power grid vulnerability model first applies probabilistic uh, fragility functions to estimate damage states of the main components of the power network. Uh, then a topological model is applied to assess the power outage. So during the recovery stage of the power system, uh, we model the emergency response plan and the operational uh, plan of the local utility companies. Uh, and uh, uh, this model uh, estimates recovery resources to repair damaged components uh, based on a priority oriented strategy, which means they will first uh, recover those that are most important and later recover the residential. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so through this integrated simulation, we investigate how the risk of uh, how the risk of local residents experience, experience, experiencing TC blackout heat with compound hazard may change from current to future climate. So we first apply this to Harris County in Texas, so which including the major parts of Houston City. So Harris County has the highest population density along the Gulf Coast and located in subtropical, sub uh, which may face disproportionately large increase in heat wave and TCs in a warming climate in a warming climate. So we first evaluate the power outage and the recovery process uh, with historical case uh, Ike and uh, Harvey. So we could find that our model performed well uh, as shown here. So the blue curve is observed and the red is modeled. So they match quite well. So with this validated the model, then we apply to each zip code of Harris County uh, to capture the, uh, the how many percent of local residents would experience longer than five days of power outage or a compound hazard in current and future climate. So by current climate, we mean that's the climate from 2000 to 2020. And for future climate, we mean that's the climate from 2080 to 2100. Uh, so uh, we could find that under cli current climate, only 14% of residents uh, of Harris County may experience over five day power outage, but in future, the number is 44%. So, a uh, longer than five day compound hazard is rare on the current climate. Uh, and we can see that only 0.8% of people may experience that. However, in future, 18.2% uh, of residents may experience the compound hazard. So this alarms us the compound hazard risk will dramatically increase over the next century in the United States. So thank you. Okay, um, sorry we're running late, but we're happy to take questions if people still have time. Um, I saw a question here for AV. What is the temporal resolution of flood maps? Is it for a flood event or daily, weekly, et cetera? Uh, yeah, so it's a good question. So the temporal resolution, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, the temporal resolution is basically like a one hour resolution. So that's the resolution that we have the um, rainfall and the storm tides. So this is kind of, they're like event-based flood maps. So each of the synthetic events is a tropical cyclone. Um, and then we have the input data at one hour temporal resolution. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, okay. I questions when doing Monte Carlo simulation how many sample members do you usually use um, so for for Monte Carlo simulations you can simulate basically we do thousands of storms for a climate condition like for the whole Atlantic we can do at least a thousand for the 
a climate, one climate state and for one climate model. So you can imagine we would be doing thousands or tens of thousands of storms to recover different climate models and different climate state. But that doesn't cost too much time to that. The, what costs the time is downstream. When you simulate the flooding, um, every event will cost a lot of time. So when you generate storms, you want to consider how much you can do in terms of flooding analysis. But we also mentioned that we use the optimal sampling method that can reduce that number to a number that will be doable for flood analysis. Uh, second question, just using deterministic TC wind file combined with background winds. Uh, we do combine with background winds. I did, we didn't go into detail that. The TC wind profile gives us the vortex wind, but also account for the background winds based on um, a simple empirical method. So background wind is approximately um, 0.6 times the translation speed uh, rotated by 20 degrees. So we have a paper on that. Um, what is spatial and temporal resolutions of TC wind model? Uh, the TC wind model, again, it is a, a wind profile you can have as high resolution, spatial resolution as you, as you want. Um, it's not a, a numerical simulation, so it's, a, it's just an analytical. Uh, in terms of temporal resolution, again, it can also be um, any resolution, but it depends on what is the time resolution of your track. Say we generate the track maybe um, every, every uh, two hours, based on the uh, Emmanuel's method, every two hours we have a location of the storm, intensity of storm and so on. So that would be the every two hours we can generate the wind. Uh, uh, if we use our model based on the uh, historical observations of the storm, best track has every six hours you have an update. So that will be every six hours you have a storm characteristics to generate a wind field. Uh, the next question for the operational side, is there a operational predictions tool for of TC track for ongoing hurricane? How are early warning system working? Um, so our study has been more focusing on the long-term projection of hurricanes and the many people study on the uh, operational side and hurricane, National Hurricane Center use various uh, larger scale models to predict the TC tracks. So because they're focusing on one coming track, so these very high modulate hurricanes. Um, so uh, our model is actually more of a simplified uh, model to be able to do a lot of simulations very quickly for future projection. But there are some overlaps. So some the simple model we can we use here could also be applied for quick estimation of in, oncoming storms as well. Uh, is there a accessible link to get the archive model data set of your TC wind rainfall model output? Um, our recent papers have all have statement at the end about the data availability and most of this data have been already deposited into open resources. So if you're interested in checking our papers at the end, you will find the link to get the, the data set. Next question, are these flood maps available to download? Um, I, um, I think uh, depending on which specific flood maps, the data is already available um, in published paper, we have data available, uh, but I guess AVA, we could make this more, even more user-friendly to have maps um, yeah. to be available. And in fact, we're developing a website, so we could put these maps there that could be uh, easier to download in addition to the, the other public deposit. Yeah, most of our other data sets are on like the design safe portal. So um, you can check our papers and the flood maps we can upload also to design safe so they could be publicly available too. Okay. I think those are the questions that I see. Any other questions? We'll go back to Lauren and Christina and Lynn to close it out. Yeah, um, that was great. Thank you so much to Dr. Lynn and um, 
and your lab for those great presentations. Um, it's really engaging. Um, we're excited that we had another successful early career webinar and um, looking forward to another one probably this fall. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Uh, the recorded session will be available on AGU YouTube channel later. Also, you can find us on oh, Twitter, AGU Global Change and AGU Global Environmental Change um, website. Okay, uh, be safe and we will see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you Thank all you. so much. <laughs>